Hello guys and welcome back to another video. The year is 1997 and I present you this little Pentium PC. Now this is a real relic from my childhood as I had the exact same PC case when I was a kid. Now this one has been sitting on my shelf for a very long time and I never really looked at it. But it has all the ingredients for a good retro build. It has the HP CD writer, a LED display, turbo button, and a typical 90s case. One of the more modern looking cases before everybody was switching to ATX and Pentium 2 based systems. On the back there is some work on the power supply it seems as the monitor connector is a bit fiddly. The VGA card seems to be missing a bracket. There is a sound card installed but I don't see any serial ports or parallel ports so I think we'll need to open the PC up and see what we have inside. And inside we see a big mess of IDE cables, brackets being shoved in there. The IO brackets just were thrown into the case it seemed so yeah. That's why it's always a good idea to look inside before you turn on a PC. <laughs> so yeah, lots of the IDE cables weren't even connected so this thing wouldn't start. All of the uh, cables for the LEDs on the case and the buttons weren't connected. But we have two hard drives, we have two optical drives, we have a disk drive, a sound card and video card and fully loaded memory. So let's see how we can make this work. So let's start by removing some of the clutter here. I'll start with the uh, I.O. panels and the IDE ribbon cables so that we can have a better look on the main board and the other components. So this is an AT style case with an AT style power connector. So we're going to be removing that as well. And as you can see, the main board isn't really screwed on or anything. It's basically just held into place by the uh, one expansion card that still has a bracket. <laughs> and speaking of expansion cards, let's see what we got, starting with the VGA card. So this is a PCI-based VGA card. And Lord and behold, what we have here is something really exciting because this is a 3D Blaster Banshee. Now this is a card from uh, Creative Labs and it's actually a 3DFX uh, Voodoo based chipset that we have here. So we don't need a separate Voodoo card anymore. So this is VGA 2D and 3D combined. Moving on to the sound card, which was another pleasant surprise. So here we have an AW64 ISA based sound card, a CT4520. A really nice uh, card to, to have in an MS-DOS uh, or Windows 98 uh, gaming PC. Our RAM banks are fully populated, so we have two types of RAM. We have the Edo RAM and the SD RAM. And we have a heatsink on the CPU, but we don't seem to have a CPU cooler. And we have a main board that should be relatively easy to get out of the case, as it isn't screwed in at all. So we're just going to pop this one out. I actually forgot that this is one of those cases where the backlit can be unscrewed and then can be taken down which would make it a lot easier to extract the main board from the case. <laughs> so I did it the hard way here. So this is a nice little Pentium based uh, main board. We'll take a closer look at it in a bit going over all of the interesting components which are on here. And as you can see inside the case the PC builder here didn't opt to use any spacers so that's why the main board was a bit uh, fiddly and very loose. But let's move on to the hard drives. We have two of them in this PC. The first one being this Seagate Metalist ST32532A which is a 2.5 gigabyte hard drive. And a second one, which also appears to be a Seagate, the Metalist 4321. So I think this is a four gigabyte hard drive. It always amazes me that with the amount of numbers on a hard drive label, sometimes it's very difficult to see the actual capacity of a hard drive. I don't even think it's written down here. So yeah, two very nice Seagate hard drives. 
I won't bother by uh, looking at the optical drives because that's pretty pretty standard stuff but I will be testing the power supply on this PC so I'll be hooking up a hard drive and I'm going to be taking my multimeter to do some measurements and to see if the 5 volt and 12 volt rails which is easily accessible via the Molex connector give proper readouts so let's insert the power cable into the PC and turn it on and see what she does. So we're seeing a clean 5.15 volts, which is nice. So let's look at the 12 volts. And also there we get 11.8 volts, which is definitely acceptable. So let's take a look at the main board. So this is a 5SVA mainboard. So luckily there is some markings on the silk screen and also on this ISO slot we can see that this is a tomato board 5SVA 512. The capacitor seems to be in excellent condition, although you can never be sure visually, but if they're not bulls that's already a good sign. This is using the VIA uh, Apollo chipset instead of the Intel one. So all of the memory banks are properly filled. There are two types of RAM here. Um, so we have four uh, SIM modules, each 16 megabytes, giving a total of 64. And then we have an additional one, uh, 32 megabytes, which give the uh, machine a total of 96 megabytes of RAM. Now, as you can see, there is a heat sink here on the CPU, but there is no cooler. Now, there was a uh, fan installed at some point, as you can see on the uh, screw markings on the heatsink. So let's remove the heatsink and see what kind of CPU we have here. So this is a Socket 7, and it's an Intel Pentium MMX CPU. And this is a 200 megahertz uh, Intel Pentium CPU. MMX giving the CPU an additional 57 instructions specifically targeted for multimedia and gaming, although most of us think this was just a marketing trick. But this 200 megahertz was for a while the fastest Pentium out there until they released the Pentium 233 MMX to compete with the AMD CPUs. Now the main board features three PCI slots and three 16-bit ISA slots. There is a lot of integrated I.O. present here, so if we take a look, here we have a connector for PS2 USB, something that this mainboard supports. We have a floppy drive connector and two hard drive connectors. We have two serial ports and we have a parallel port. So that's the cool thing about these Pentium mainboards, that you don't lose expansion slots over this I.O. stuff. This mainboard also has a coin cell battery, which is very handy, so no leaking batteries. And here we have a set of connectors for the case, LEDs, buttons, PC speaker, and stuff like that. And the connector on the top here is to hook up a USB port or a PS2 mouse port. Now, I did install a cooler on the CPU because these Intel Pentium 200 megahertz CPUs tend to get hot and they do need a fan, so a heatsink alone is not sufficient. So let's see if we can get the PC to boot now as we have cleaned it up a little bit. I have only inserted the VGA card, so it is starting as the Pentium MMX 200 megahertz, mainboard dating from mid-97. 98 megabytes of RAM, which is the 32 plus 64. It detects all of the hard drives and optical drives. And then we get the CMOS checksum error plus the CMOS battery failed. So we need to replace the coin cell on the main board, which I'm going to be doing here. Now, one thing I found really annoying with this main board is that a lot of connectors are placed vertically and very much to the side where you would normally fit expansion slots. For example, this I.O. bracket here for the serial port, I would normally put it here, but because these ribbon connectors are there, I just, I can't put it anywhere. So the three top uh, places where I would put this are occupied so I am forced to put this where I would normally put a PCI expansion card. So that's a bit uh, annoying on this main board. Same thing with this uh, bracket for the 
PS2 mouse. I mean, I would normally put it on top, but it's either going to hit the ribbon cable or the power connector. So again, I need to move it down. Now, moving on to the Voodoo Banshee. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the Voodoo card itself right now, but I am going to be tackling this bracket issue here. Now, it's very annoying that we don't have one, so we need to find a card that matches. And as you will see, there is no standard with regards to where the VGA port is put on a bracket. But luckily, I did found a card that matches up really nicely. This S3 Verge uh, VGA card that I'd be happy to sacrifice its bracket for. So I'm just going to be removing the bracket and see how well it fits. But it's not only the positioning of the VGA connector which is important, it's also these two screws here that are used to mount the bracket onto the PCB. So most likely those will not match up. So we'll need to find a solution for those. But let's first remove the bracket from the S3 Verge card and see how well it fits. And let's give it a go. And as expected, although this will match up pretty nicely, there is no hole in the PCB on the top to fasten the bracket. And also on the bottom, it doesn't really line up. So in the end, I decided to just to go ahead and remove this little part here because otherwise it would prevent the card from being inserted into the case correctly. So it was the only option that I saw. So with that removed, the VGA card can be installed perfectly. So with the VGA card installed, I powered up the PC and I noticed that the case LEDs were working properly and also the buttons were hooked up correctly. But the LED display that indicates the megahertz wasn't working. So taking a look inside the case, if we zoom in a little bit here, it's pretty difficult to see, but there is this uh, little green PCB here and it has two pins exposed and that needs to be where the power should be applied. And this requires five volts and there is a five volt cable coming from the power supply, which is this one. It's a two pin cable, red and black. So we need to guess the polarity here, but once hooked up, the LED should work fine. The turbo button is also hooked up to the uh, LED PCB, so there is no turbo switch on the main board itself. So the turbo switch doesn't do anything, the only thing it does is it will toggle the LED display from low to high and back. So next step is to install an operating system onto the PC and I'm going to go with Windows 98 obviously. I have the startup disk, so we can launch the Windows 98 setup from the a floppy disk and then it will move over to the Windows 98 CD and it will happily install Windows 98 hopefully. Now when Windows 98 setup was finalizing it did throw a couple of errors on startup which is somewhat worrisome. So I thought the initial Windows 98 install went fine but it did reboot uh, all of a sudden during the installation which is not good. I also ended up getting these blue screens which are also very bad news. When I was working with the PC, sometimes it would just lock up. It would throw all kinds of errors. It would attempt to fix these errors, but it never ran really stable. And at random moments, it would just drop out and give you this blue screen of death. Sometimes the PC simply hanged completely, so it didn't respond to any keyboard or mouse input anymore. And sometimes that keyboard and mouse input sounded like this. Now despite the fact that a mem test didn't show anything after a couple of hours, this SD RAM component appears to be the guilty one. Because after removing that and continuing the machine with 64 megabytes, it has run flawlessly ever since. Now, despite the fact that the machine does struggle a little bit with direct 3D games because the Pentium 200 MHz does have its limitations, the machine really excels in these 3D FX based games where the full power of the Voodoo chip becomes very apparent. And this was a thing that blew everybody's minds back in the late 90s when people start having these Voodoo chips into their PCs. 
these games look like they came from another planet. You have these very specific, recognizable voodoo-based textures that you see in all of these games, making them very fast. Games like Forsaken, for example, this just wouldn't be possible at all without a voodoo chip on this type of hardware. The CPU would never be able to render stuff like this. You do still sometimes see it struggle even in the 3DFX department. A game like Carmageddon, for example, which is fairly demanding on the hardware, isn't running as smooth as it should on this Pentium 200 MMX. You know, this might be a driver issue or a config issue. I still need to look into that, but it doesn't, yeah, just doesn't feel right at this point. But then you have another classic like Quake, which is running excellent on this machine with the Voodoo Banshee. So this definitely brings back a lot of memories. So I really hope you've enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. There will be a part two on this machine where I'll be going a little bit more in depth on the software setup side of things and do some comparisons with other Voodoo cars. So if you like this video, please consider subscribing, giving it a thumbs up and commenting. And I'll hope to see you guys soon. Bye bye.